So starting us off will be Dr. Greenberg. She received her MD in Neuropathology PhD in Sao Paulo, Brazil. She co-founded the Brain Bank in Sao Paulo, Brazil. At the University of Würzburg in Germany, she learned tri-dimensional brain reconstruction, which she utilizes a lot now. As an assistant professor at UCSF, she studies neuropathology of the brainstem, in particular, how brainstem nuclei are differentially affected across neurodegenerative disease. Uh, Dr. Greenberg, can, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks for the nice introduction, Christine. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being here and for being supporting our uh, studies and trying to find a cure for CBD and PSP. I have a very sensitive task this morning that is to introduce our autopsy program, but I hope that by the end of my talk, I will uh, convey to you a very positive message of how important is this program for our uh, research here and for all the patients affected by these diseases. Uh, when we look at brains of uh, uh, people that were affected by PSP and CBD, we see some similarities. In both diseases, we see deposits of a protein that's called tau. This tau protein uh, becomes abnormal and they deposit in the brain. And because of this, both CBD and PSP are part of a group of diseases called tauopathies. The tau gene is just one gene, but from its RNA, we can have six different sli uh, slightly different proteins. In human adults, we have a balance of these six types of proteins, but when we have a disease, sometimes we have an imbalance. For instance, uh, when we have, uh, in PSP and CBD, we have a prevalence of these forms of four repeat tau. So these are uh, some uh, similarities between these two diseases. However, there are some differences as well. For every disease, there are areas in the brain that are vulnerable and areas that are not. So I hope to be able to illustrate here. This is a slide of tissue uh, of CBD, and we are looking for tau protein. Everything you see in brown means abnormal protein. Everything you see in blue, it's normal. So as you can see here in CBD, we have a lot of deposition of proteins in the white matter. And here in PSP, the white matter is not vulnerable, but in the cortex, we see uh, um, a higher burden of pathology. The same is true when we go to the high magnification in the microscope, we really go uh, high, and we see that the changes we see in PSP, they are slightly different, even in shape, than the difference we see in <laughs> CBD. So it means that although these two diseases have similarities, they also have differences, and probably the way we will use to treat them will be a little bit different. So it's very important that we can detect precisely which disease we are talking about when we want to have a successful treatment. Unfortunately, nowadays we still need post-mortem examination to do a definitive diagnosis of PSP and CBD. This is a very sensitive uh, problem again, and we hope that in the future we won't be able to need it anymore. So we are trying to uh, make uh, use of uh, uh, this kind of studies that we have to do now to really improve what we can offer in the future. And it's already happening at some point. So just to illustrate what I'm saying, so let's uh, think on uh, PSP. P uh, patients who have a clinical diagnosis of PSP and patients who have a clinical diagnosis of CBD. Uh, despite the fact that we are being much more precise nowadays than in the past, when we do post-mortem examination, we still see that patients that have a diagnosis of CBD, for instance, they can have actually different pathologies in the brain. And it means that the treatment from each one of these persons would have to be different when available. And this is data from our uh, brain bank here at UCSF. And then I want to take the opportunity to introduce our program here, our autopsy program. 
that have the mission really to inform caregivers, families, and clinicians, and researchers, uh, providing a, the most comprehensive and definitive neuropathological assessment available. So with this, it's not only that we can inform uh, patients and families and educate clinicians, so in the future they will learn how to diagnose this disease and uh, probably to treat it in early and a more successful way, but also we help researchers to improve and to optimize clinical testings that do not require post-mortem examinations, so we can do a precise diagnosis uh, for patients and, again, provide the best treatment without having to uh, 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 make use of uh, uh, post-mortem tissue to do research. And I would like to introduce our team here. It's a very large team of uh, dedicated people. Uh, the director of the Brain Bank, it's uh, Bill Seeley. It's a very accomplished uh, neurologist who got the MEC, uh, the, who got the, I'm sorry. Now, <laughs> it's a very accomplished neurologist, and uh, he got a MacArthur uh, uh, Fellowship two years ago. And I want to introduce Kelly Hitchner, who is our uh, administrator. And Kelly actually will represent our team in the question and answer question because we have a donation this morning, and I will have to go and help, help it out as soon as I finish here. I would like to introduce Ian, who is our uh, coordinator, and uh, Jean Yang, who is part of our very uh, uh, brilliant uh, technician team. And uh, finally, I would like to show you some of the highlights uh, in studies with tauopathies that we could accomplish here in the last three years uh, based on the uh, autopsy program. Uh, this first uh, work here has been published last year, and what we did here, we could show that some changes in the style protein we are talking about, that it's uh, very, very toxic and really cause disease. It's present in CBD, it's present in PSP, but it's not present in a kind of change that we call argyrophilic grain disease. I know it's a strange name. And this argyrophilic grain disease is seen it's in a lot of patients with CBD and PSP. And we hypothesize that actually to have these changes, it's positive, it's a protective mechanism against the spread of the disease. So now we are working further to be able to uh, prove this hypothesis, and then we will be able to work in ways to uh, induce our own body to produce this kind of changes as a natural remedy, probably, against the spread of these uh, two diseases. Another uh, research uh, study that has been published uh, lately from our group, they, they, they are trying to use uh, imaging, brain imaging, that is, it's no invasive, it's done in the clinics, to distinguish between different pathologies in life. So again, we can provide the best treatment and the most accurate diagnosis. And they could show that uh, diseases that have the same uh, clinical symptoms that in this case is some problems with language. When we do imaging and we see changes first in the white matter as opposed to the gray matter, it indicates if it is tau positive pathology or if the pathology is caused by another molecule. And finally, in a study uh, led by Dr. Susie Lee, who just uh, talked to you this morning, uh, she studied uh, what will be the clinical phenotypes of patients who had a neuropathological diagnosis of cortical basal degeneration. And uh, for our surprise, even in uh, very specialized centers like ours here, we still see uh, a lot of uh, heterogeneous, uh, it's very heterogeneous. So in these patients, uh, only actually 35 percent they have uh, CBD, and in other patients, uh, in 23%, they have Alzheimer's disease. So they had a clinical diagnosis of CBS, which is the uh, clinical term that we see in patients with uh, uh, cere uh, cerebral basal degeneration. But actually, 23%, they have a different kind of pathology, and even pathologies that has nothing to do with the tau protein. And this is very important because with this data, we can go backwards and look at our clinical charts and really design better uh, methods and better clinical assessments so we can distinguish these types of pathology when, the, when uh, the patients first come here. So again, we can provide the best treatment. 
And since I'm talking about our brain donation program, a lot of questions come in mind for everybody. So we try to list some of them here. And of course, we will be able to answer all your questions and concerns during the questions and answer uh, uh, session. But uh, we would like to stress that uh, brain donation is compatible with funeral plans. It doesn't change at all. And uh, there is no cost for the family or the participant. Usually, we are able to provide a very comprehensive diagnosis. I would say uh, the average is six months. And uh, we can really, uh, this autopsy program, it's really important for us to advance research and provide better care for patients and families in the future. And we have an email and also a telephone number in which uh, people who uh, would like to ask more questions in the future can feel uh, free to contact us. And finally, I would like to thank all UCSF patients and families that have been supporting our research and being participating in our programs here, and also our funding sources. Uh, uh, we, have source, we have funding sources from the NIH federal sources and also from uh, private foundations, and this is very important to keep us going. And thank you very much.